Can everyone see this? Yeah, yeah can everyone see my one? Yeah, okay, good. So I feel like shock is something that sort of is mentioned a lot, but I think in MD1 and 2, I didn't really have a good definition for shock. And consultants are like, oh, the patient's in shock. And I'd be like, okay, so they have low blood pressure, right? So, but like, I, I think a formal um, sort of classification or identification or definition of shock is pretty useful. So um, I think about shock as um, inadequate perfusion. And I'm not sure if um, in your ED tutorials, um, your sort of your tutors have said this to you, but I, what I find with my ED um, tutorials is that um, ED phys physicians are very focused on perfusion, um, especially end organ perfusion and tissue level oxygenation. So a lot of the management is actually to maximize um, perfusion to the peripheral tissues um, in order to avoid um, necrosis, ischemia, and the acidosis that comes with, um, with a lack of perfusion. Um, and so basically, to just repeat, inadequate tissue level oxygenation due to poor perfusion, um, such that the vital organ um, function is not maintained, is my definition of shock. Um, and as Alex and I discussed before, um, sort of there are multiple types of shock and I've grouped it into four different categories. Um, so we'll start off with the first one, which is my hypovolemic, which is my hypovolemic shock. And the causes for hypovolemic shock, I think about trauma, blood loss, dehydration, um, inadequate therapy. Um, I can have third spacing and my burn patients. Okay. So you, you'll find that some types of shocks do repeat, um, sort of overlap in different categories. So for example, um, sort of your, your burns patient, that can be your distributive as well. So classifications can overlap sometimes, but usually I put my burns patient as my hypervolemia patients because, um, uh, sort of you're losing that skin barrier and sort of your e evaporative loss is greater than um, your fluid input into the body um, and that's why you get an overall state of um, fluid deficiency and uh, same occurs with third spacing same occurs with trauma blood loss etc and when I think about shock in general I have three parameters that help me to sort of delineate between the different types of shocks. So one's cardiac output. Second is my pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And my third is actually my pulmonary vascular resistance. And although, although it doesn't sort of change management as much in identification of different types of shock, I certainly want to assess whether, um, first of all, is cardiac output increased or decreased? Second of all, is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure increased or decreased? Um, and just to give an example, in distributive or septic shock, I can have a cardiac output that is decreased. Uh, sorry, that is increased. Um, however, in hypervolemic shock, I, I can get a cardiac output that is decreased. And um, for example, when I'm considering pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, I can have a decreased PCWP in hypervolemic shock. However, I can have an increased PCWP in um, obstructive for, for, um, shocks, for example, cardiac tamponade. Um, and for those of you who don't know what PCWP is, it's basically a surrogate measure of what's distal to the pulmonary capillaries. Um, so basically the left atrium. Um, so it's to measure the pressure in the left atrium um, as a surrogate measure sort of of um, um, the level of destruction um, that is distal to your pulmonary capillaries. And similarly with pulmonary vascular resistance, um, 
sort of, I think about it in pulmonary embolism. Um, I think about it in um, congestive heart failure, what implications it has to my pulmonary venous resistance. So for example, in cardiogenic shock with CHF, my pulmonary vascular resistance will be increased. Whereas compared to a septic shock, where there is an overall um, sort of an um, sort of a sympathetic nervous system overdrive and my um, distributive um, losses sort of through to the peripheries, then I can get something that decreases my pulmonary vascular resistance. I think I'll flesh out that a little bit more when we, when we sort of do the different types of shocks. But just for an overview, I do think about cardiac output, PCWP and PVRs uh, for my different types of shock. Um, so we've talked about causes of hypervolemic shock. Um, in terms of treatment, um, and I'll go through different types of fluid therapy just at the end, but um, isotonic is usually the rule of thumb if you don't know what you're using. So I think about fluid in terms of hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic solutions. And isotonic is usually used in resuscitations. Um, and usually the agent of choice is either normal saline or um, compound sodium lactate, so CSL, or sometimes called ringer's lactate. Um, or even if in pediatric population, you can use plasmolite 148. So those are all valid options of isotonic solutions um, so for fluid therapy. And if I have blood loss, usually the rule of thumb to think about what to replenish with is I'm replacing like with like. If I'm losing fibrinogen, for example, in situations like disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, then I would give cryoprecipitate, which is high in fibrinogen. So basically as a, a principle of thinking, what are you losing? You're trying to replenish that. But in a patient with blood loss, you're losing fluid as well. So as a general rule of thumb, um, if you don't have VBGs to have an accurate representation of hemoglobin, how I think about sort of um, replenishing is I want to replenish fluid to blood in a three to one ratio. Um, so blood in a three to one ratio. Um, and so the decision of when I want to start blood transfusion, so I've asked the anesthetist that question and the answer is that it's actually a very long answer to a simple question. So you wouldn't want to base your decision solely on a hemoglobin level. For example, if a person is chronically anemic and they have a hemoglobin level of 80, you wouldn't transfuse them. However, if in a young, healthy adult with rapid blood loss, you know that their baseline hemoglobin will probably be like 120 to 130. However, if that drastically acutely changes to maybe a level of 80 or even 75, then you would transfuse that patient. But that's just sort of um, basic introduction transfusion. If you want to know, or if you want to know more about transfusion, there are talks um, at Australian Hematology Society, Australian Students Hematology Society, um, which is another society that I run, which has interesting seminars and talks on when to give what products, and also um, sort of the resuscitation. Um, sort of um, therapies that you would initiate in certain hematological conditions. Um, but just for the sake of this talk, I usually think about it in a three to one ratio, fluid to blood ratio. Um, so that is it for hypervolemic shock. My second is my cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock. My causes, as I said, CHF, um, arrhythmia can actually cause as well, um, my mitral regurgitations, or even other valvular diseases which impact on cardiac output. Um, VSD, does anyone know what population of patients VSD is common in? Do you mean my pediatrics or? Yeah, pediatric patients, very good. Um, and MI. Now, if I have a small MI, I might not have cardiogenic shock. However, it tends to occur in patients with greater than 40% of function reduction as a result of myocardial infarction. Um, so pretty big myocardial infarction, um, compromising left ventricular 
um, function. Uh, and subsequently it decreases cardiac output. Subsequently you can classify as a cardiogenic um, shock. And the reason is because you have inadequate tissue level oxygenation due to poor perfusion, due to poor cardiac output, due to 40% of left ventricular function is impaired because of your myocardial infarction. So in this case, so going back to hypervolemic shock, cardiac output is decreased because I have low volume state. My, my pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is also decreased. And the reason is because there's less blood um, flowing through my cardiac chambers. There's less pressure generated in my left atrium. Therefore, feeding back, there's less pressure in the pulmonary capillaries. And um, pulse, uh, sorry, pulmonary venous resistance um, is actually increased in hypovolemic um, shock. Um, and the reason is because of um, certain localized mediators, for example, endothelin um, that actually constricts the pulmonary vessels, as far as my understanding of it. Um, so that's the parameters for hypervolemic shock. In comparison, cardiogenic shock, cardiac output is actually decreased again. However, the difference is my pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is actually increased. So as remember when I said pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, it's a surrogate measure of the left atrial pressure. That's actually increased in cardiogenic shock. When I'm thinking about a patient, for example, with valvular diseases or um, severe mitral regurgitation, what do you think happens to the left atrial pressure? Would it increase? <laughs> yeah, it would increase or it might stay the same or it might increase. And because of that increase, that's why I'm up sort of feeding it back more proximally the pressure. I actually have an increase in pulmonary capillary weight pressure, if that makes sense to everyone. And subsequently, as a result of an increase in um, my pulmonary capillary, capillary wedge pressure, I have an increase in pulmonary venous um, resistance as a result of that pressure backload and um, sort of my vasculature in my pulmonary circulation is increased as well. Okay. Um, and in terms of treatment for cardiogenic shock, um, one key sort of echoing theme um, in management of these patients is you want to treat the cause um, if possible. Um, and sometimes you would give anotropic support with presses. Um, so you would give anotropic support such as dopamine if they're hypotensive. So dopamine. Again, guidelines differ with how they manage these patients. As a general rule, dopamine is used if the patient's um, hypertensive and dopamine is usually used if they're not hypotensive. Um, and sort of going back to inotrope, um, what inotrope means is that it increases car cardiac contractibility. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a word, but it increases the strength that the cardiac muscles are contracting at. And there is actually a lot of positive inotropic agents. For example, your, um, your digoxin, your a calcium is actually another positive inotropic um, agent. Um, and uh, of course, your catecholamines such as the um, dopamine, noradrenaline, dobutamine are all inotropic um, stuff and your vasopressors so your, your pr when when, when um, people talk about presses they, they they mean vasopressors and vasopressors um are things which um if you went to unimelp you'll know that stephen harrop likes to think that it presses your vasos so it basically constricts your blood vessels further um and these can be um, sort of your vasopressin and stuff like that acting on um, blood vessels and also the renal tubules. So um, one key clinical pearl here is that in hypervolemic shock, you wouldn't actually give presses 
straight away. However, you can give presses in cardiogenic shock patients. And that's why the um, distinction of the two is sometimes important. And the reason is because if the patient's already hypovolemic, if you give presses, it constricts the blood vessels. Um, and sometimes you don't want that to happen unless they're adequate, adequately hydrated. And the reason is because as a result of constriction and the hypovolemia, you can cause ischemic um, strokes or you can cause ischemic um, infarcts to the myocardial tissue um, if you're pressing the, um, the con if you're sort of constricting the blood vessels too much without an adequate fluid status. So basically you can think about it if there's not much blood in my vessels and I'm constricting it at the same time, that's going to cause ischemia and further decrease in perfusion. So it's used once you, you think that you've got adequate fluid resuscitation that's already provided, then you would um, consider presses in hypovolemic shock. And another thing is in uh, sort of your hemorrhagic shocks, um, sort of your uh, hypovolemic shock or hemorrhagic shock due to blood loss, you actually wouldn't get any clinical signs um, first if the blood loss is minimal. So what, what I mean by that is heart rate is the first vital sign to change in hemorrhagic shock. And um, so that occurs pretty soon. However, a lot of people base their decision making on blood pressures. However, you need to know that blood pressure falls only when 30 or 40 percent of the blood volume is lost um, in a patient. And that goes with pediatric populations as well. So unless they sort of um, lose enough blood, do you see the blood pressure start to drop? So your blood pressure should always be your last sign to look for. And when you have a drop in blood pressure, it often means that um, you know, your patients are critically unwell and your, your resuscitations needs to be more prompt than compared to a patient with just slight um, tachycardia. Um, and in those patients, you tend to have more time for decision making, although it still has to be a quick one. But you know that if you have a patient sort of with low blood pressure compared to a patient with just slight tachycardia, um, sort of one is more well, unwell compared to the other. So that's cardiogenic shock. And obstructive shock is actually very often seen in trauma. Um, in that there are two things that can occur. Obstructive. Um, Jason, sorry, can you just quickly repeat what you said about um, more specifically the PBR in hypovolemic shock? Yeah, so um, I okay, so this is my understanding, um, and you can definitely search it up and tell me if I've got it wrong. So in PBR, in hypovolemic shock, because you have low fluid status going through all your circulation, um, your your blood return from your um, from your pulmonary veins to the left atrium is actually low. Um, because of an overall lack of um, fluid in your body. And because that return is low, and because um, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is a measure of um, your left atrial pressure, that is low too. Okay, so moving on to PVR, your pulmonary vascular resistance. So what happens is because your pulmonary vasculature has sensors too, and it auto-regulates its resistance as a result of um, the uh, sort of your perfusion that's going through your pulmonary vessels. And things, local mediated, such as endothelium, um, and I'm not sure the other one, I think it's angio something, um, can constrict your local pulmonary blood vessels leading to an actual increase in pulmonary vascular resistance or despite the fact that you're in hypovolemic state does that make sense so kind of like a vq matching 
process going on? Uh, no, so it doesn't have to do with VQ matching because VQ matching is more sort of when you're talking about respiratory or airway diseases or lack of um, sort of airway drive. And here it's more to do with the vasculature alone. So we're not sort of thinking about, um, we're not thinking about um, sort of your um, VQ mismatches or your VQ matches as per se, because I'm not talking about sort of ventilation problems as such. So I'm just considering my vasculature and my perfusion alone. So when the pulmonary vessels is not getting enough blood, I think about it as if there is auto-regulation to say, okay, I'm gonna constrict the blood, um, I'm gonna constrict my pulmonary vasculatures a bit. And basically the same thing happens when you have a left heart failure leading to a right heart failure. Um, so when you have um, sort of a left heart failure chronically, you can have um, sort of um, mediators that's signaling to the pulmonary vasculatures to increase the pulmonary vascular resistance leading to a left heart failure. But a similar sort of concept occurs in um, hypervolemic shock where um, where sort of because you have a low fluid status and the perfusion is sensing that lack of fluid status, sort of your local constriction of the blood vessels occur in that pulmonary vasculature, leading to an overall increase in pulmonary vascular resistance despite a decrease in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Yeah, all good, thank you. Yeah, so, so the physiology is a, a bit complicated, um, but as I said, it's just a rough guide to help me think about the different causes. You don't have to be an expert on the pathophysiology of, okay, why PCWP increases or PVR decreases. You just have to know those parameters exist um, and can help you to identify the cause, um, if that makes sense. So don't, don't get bogged down if you don't sort of understand sort of crystal clear what the pathophysiology is. Um, it's pretty low yield. So obstructive. Um, so obstructive is usually seen in trauma patients. Um, so your typical presentation can be um, a guy stabbed um, with a knife to the heart or, or, or to the chest region, um, I should say. Um, and suddenly um, he he's sort of shortness of breath um, develops a respiratory rate of 50 plus um, desaturating in front of you um, and you order a chest x-ray and you see um, a, a pleural marking that is very inconsistent when comparing left to right. So you know, okay, there's some tracheal deviation as well. Okay, that's a tension pneumothorax. Um, so in tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, and even in massive pulmonary embolisms, you can get obstructive um, shock. And again, if I'm thinking about cardiac output PCWP PVR, my cardiac output um, in, in obstructive shock decreases, right? Cardiac output, um, if you're thinking about cardiac tamponade, overall state cardiac output is decreased, muffled heart sound, um, distended or engorged um, jugular, uh, not jugular veins, but just um, veins draining into um, the right um, atrium in general can be distended, leading to a visible clinical sign of um, engorged neck veins. Um, I can get muffled heart sounds because of the tamponade, um, and I can get low cardiac output or hypotension as a result. And if I'm thinking about tension pneumothorax, again, um, I'm creating um, so I think about tension pneumothorax as if I think about it as a mass of air that's actually having a positive mass effect. And that can obstruct my um, cardiac um, outlet sort of to my aorta, compressing on the, um, so the, the exit passage of the blood out, so, um, out from the heart, uh, leading to low cardiac output, um, leading to obstructive shock. So in obstructive shock, I'll just write it down here, cardiac tamponade. Pneumothorax um, and massive PEs can all give you obstructive shock pitches. And in obstructive shock, PCWP goes up um, and same goes your pulmonary vascular resistance. Um, 
but don't don't go, don't go for the details i think that may just confuse you a bit with um the pathophysiology but just know that the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure goes up again if you want to think about it because the um there's an there's an obstruction distal to the left atrium therefore my left atrial pressure goes up therefore my pcwp goes up um and because of that same obstruction my pulmonary vasculature goes up too um if that makes sense Okay, so management for obstructive shock is, again, you treat the underlying cause. So for car cardiac tamponade, you go through pericardiocentesis. Um, if you go, um, if you have tension pneumothorax, you have um, decompression of the pneumothorax through either needle decompression or um, through in, um, inserting a chest drain. And in terms of massive pulmonary embolism, then you give thrombolysis if the time is indicated. And also you follow them up with um, sort of six months, actually, no, three months if it's triggered, I think. Yeah, three months if it's triggered, six months if it's untriggered um, pulmonary embolism. You treat them with anticoagulation, basically, depending on whether it's um, triggered or not untriggered um, PE. Anyway, that's a that's a talk for another time, um, but that's it for obstructive um, shock, and sort of moving on to my last category. Any questions there? So in my last category, I actually have distributed down, but I also have subcategories where I think about the different causes. So I can either have a septic patient, I can have an anaphylactic patient, I can have a patient having surge response, or I can have a neurogenic um, sort of cause. Um, and septic usually goes with distributive. However, anaphylactic, SERS and neurogenic, I consider as its own category per se, just because the management differs a lot with those. So in distributive or septic, again, as the name suggests, septic means I uh, probably have an infection somewhere. So usually it's, it's caused by um, bacteremia. And especially gram-negative organisms. So who can tell me what agents are used to, to treat gram-negatives? Actually, tell me some bugs that are gram negative. Anyone? There's actually, there's actually a lot. So, your, pardon? E. coli. Yeah, E. coli. Yeah. Typical, um, your gut bacteria, gram negative E. coli. Very good. So, um, so I think about sort of my antibiotics in terms of what agent is likely to be there. Again, or we'll do that a bit later today, but just as a general rule, um, gram negatives, um, also pseudomonas, um, anaerobes, gut anaerobes. Um, I think about the coverage of the different antibiotics with um, the possible agents. So usually gram negatives uh, are aminoglycosides. So gentamicin covers gram negatives, ciprofloxacin co um, covers gram negatives. Um, you know, my third generation kefosporin, so um, keftriaxone is a very good agent which covers um, gram negative rods. Um, and also my keftazidine is actually very good in covering gram negative rods as well as pseudomonas. So, um, so usually keftriaxone can be used um, or even in, um, I think, critical care or ICU, um, Piptaz is, a, is, is often used. So Piptaz is sort of your broad coverage co covering your enterococcus, um, gram-positive cocci, um, gram-negative rods, pseudomonas, anaerobes. So that's covering sort of a, a more basic, um, so sorry, uh, covering a more broad range of bugs. So Piptaz can sometimes be used. However, in this case, because my septic shock is often caused by gram negatives, my penicillin, um, my first generation kephlosporins, um, my, um, my vancomycin, my, my daptomycin, my, my, my linozolid, my 
clean the mice in my bathroom is probably not good enough to cover for all my gram negatives and pseudomonas. Um, or doxycycline and azithromycin, for example. Th those are not good agents because I'm trying to cover gram negatives. So if you go with superfloxacin, um, levofloxacin, um, my meropenem even for ESBL coverage as well, um, or keftriaxone, piptaz are all possible um, agents used um, in antibiotic cover. But we'll, we'll do a bit more when sort of after this. Anyways, so... Broad-spectrum antibiotics, first of all. Um, so, and then you would measure central venous pressure and give fluid until the central venous pressure is about eight. Um, and the reason is because um, sort of establishing that um, CVP is pretty critical in bacteremic patients because they can crash very easily. Um, and you, you want to sort of target your fluid therapy um, based on the CVP for distributive shock patients. Um, presses, nor, sort of your noradrenaline, dopamine are sometimes used as well. And you would sort of coming back to the antibiotics point, you would often get cultures before administration of antibiotics. So usually you would want to go with anaerobic bottle and aerobic bottle times two. Um, for blood cultures before administrating antibiotics. So I'll just write here, as a general rule, um, your antibiotics should be done. Your um, fluid therapy should be targeting to a CVP of about um, eight. Um, your presses are sometimes used. Um, so your noradrenaline, your... Um, your dopamine can be used and cultures for ABX. Okay. So, um, just quickly on management of anaphylactic patients. So, a patient comes in with bee sting or food allergies after having peanuts. Um, very simple, no adrenaline um, or epinephrine, depending on which hemisphere you come from. Um, so one, one by 1000 is usually the ratio. So one to 1000, no adrenaline, and you want to give them 500 mics, um, IM or about, I think about 10 to 12, don't quote me on that 10 to 12 IV, um, um, IV, um, no adrenaline. Um, sorry, adrenaline, not a noradrenaline, adrenaline, <clears throat> my bad. Um, so you don't give no, them noradrenaline, you give them adrenaline, um, one by, um, one by 1,000. So usually it's one milligram per meal. They dilute it in, um, in either 10,000 or 1,000. So usually it's, um, sort of 10 mics. And you, if you give, if you give, 500 mics. The, the ratio is very confusing. However, you, if you've been on the ED um, sort of department, um, you will know that they have ampules. So there's a small ampule and there's a big ampule. So as a general rule of thumb, they all contain one milligram. So if you want 500 mics, it's um, half of that. So for example, if you have a one mil compared to a 10 mil, then you'll give 0.5 mil and that's your 500 mics or you would give um five mils and that's uh, from from the big ampule and that's your 500 mics to be injected im um and iv is different um sort of dosage anyways um and sort of depending on the patient you can give antihistamines and even steroids as well depending on what symptoms they have and also what causes they have so that's it for anaphylaxis. And for my systemic inflammatory response syndrome or my SIRS, I think about it when the patient has suspected pancreatitis, if they have burns or if they have generalized trauma. Okay. Um, so those can all give you a SIRS response. Um, and again, manage the underlying cause. 
um, probably pancreatitis and burns deserve their own sort of little tutorial, especially pancreatitis. Um, there is different, um, sorry, there yeah. are different arguments with regards to whether you give NG feed, um, the, the, the targets of fluid therapy, um, which antibiotics you would give as a result of um, different causes of pancreatitis. So that's for another talk and we can do that at a later date. So I'll just tell my puppy to go outside. Okay, so we're up to neurogenic um shock so neurogenic shock after brain or spinal cord injuries um and um sort of management wise maintaining the pressure with fluid and pressure support as well um so depending on the patient um then you would have to organize whether you want a neurosurgical referral um but meanwhile in ed you want to again going through your doctor's abcd um, especially with circulation, you want to you want to manage with fluid therapy and pressor support, um, and that pressor support can be um, vasopressor, and, and usually vasopressor is given with um, your ED physician or your ICU um, sort of input. So I I don't think as an intern you'll be giving vasopressors anyways or pressors in general. Um, but that's it in terms of the different types of shock. Any questions? Can you quickly just explain why neurogenic, like what exactly is neurogenic shock and how does it even result in shock? Yeah, very good question. So neurogenic shock um, is basically from um, either brain trauma or spinal cord injury. And the underlying mechanism of um, neurogenic shock has been debated. And I think a lot believes in the fact that as a um, sort of a, 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 an acute response to a severe trauma um, to the spinal cord, um, there is sort of dysregulation to the sympathetic trunk. There's um, dysregulation of that a particular pathway to the brain. There's disruption of that trunk. There's disruption to autonomic nervous system leading to um, aberrant um, control of your cardiovascular system, even aberrant control of your respiratory symptom. But it's, it's mostly to do with your autonomic nervous system, basically. Does that answer your question? Kind of. So dysregulation to the nervous system affects cardiovascular system, which affects perfusion? Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's more sort of um, systemic than that. So basically sympathetic trunk um, runs sort of most densely in the thoracic region um, and your parasympathetic in the sacral and cranial region. So usually with spinal cord injuries to the thoracic levels, you can disru disrupt the sympathetic chain. Um, and that can have sort of your postganglionic effects onto um, your cardiac output, your, um, your control of your peripheral blood vasculature. Um, and also it can actually feed back to the um, brainstem. So your cardiovascular system control in the brainstem um, and um, sort of leading to a sort of a withdrawal response from the sudden um, impact on the spinal cord um, and have aberrant firing and aberrant control of your whole cardiovascular system. So I think I probably think about it firstly as a local effect and secondly as a feedback effect back to the brainstem and how that um, sort of how an aberrant brainstem control can lead to your um, cardiovascular collapse, your respiratory suppression, um, and, and different sort of um, even even different neurology following from that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Any other questions? So, um, just a little bit on antibiotics. 
Um, I don't have a slide or I don't have sort of notes on it per se, but I can just give you a spiel and maybe just on a piece of paper, you can jot it down. Um, so I think about my antibiotics based on my, my, um, my bugs that's, um, that I'm suspecting. So for example, um, for example, with the case that we've said about septic shock, I know it's probably gram negative organism. Then I want to target my gram negatives. If it's a, um, if I have a distal bowel um, sort of pathology, um, then I know it's probably gram negatives as well. If I have a sort of a, a, a more a more superficial pathology, um, sort of skin cellulitis, um, um, erysipelas, things like that. I probably know it's probably mostly gram positive or staphylococcus, for example. And um, that 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 whole thing changes if my patient's immunocompromised. But as a general rule of thumb, I think about it based on um, what organisms are likely to be there. Now. Um, and there's a few things which I think about. Firstly is MRSA. So actually, let's go with SA first, so Staphylococcus aureus. Um, I know it's a gram-positive coccus. Um, so um, skin organisms, um, again, if I have, um, for example, a peripheral line pudding, and if that site's inflamed, it's probably Staph aureus, then simple penicillin would work. And actually, most of the antibiotics would work on Staph aureus. But one thing you need to think about is source control and selection pressure. That's the thing you need to think about after um, administration of antibiotics. So my grand positive cocci, I can give them penicillin. I can give them nafcillin. I can give them augmentin. I can give them piptaz. But piptaz is for more sort of your severe... Um, patients who needs a broader coverage, I can give them first generation cephalosporins because first generation is better at gram positive cocci than my third of um, than my third generation um, cephalosporins. So my third generation is moving more towards my gram negative uh, gram negative rods. So I'll probably choose cephalosporin for staph um, for staph aureus, and that's why you you tend to see with um, operations. Um, Kefazolin is used rather than keftriaxone because usually what they're worried about is gram positive coccus after incision in the skin that goes into the wound leading to infection. So kefazolin is usually given um, two grams um, or even one gram. Anyway, so um, I can give them other things such as um, levofloxacin, moxifloxacin. Um, I can give them vancomycin if I know that um, there is. Um, MRSA present in the hospital. Um, I can give them daptomycin. I can give them lenozolid. I can give them clindamycin um, and azithromycin even. Um, but those are the agents that I would sort of think about or the antibiotics that I will think about if I have staph aureus alone, that is. So if I have gram-negative rods, um, then I can think about, okay, if I have gram-negative rods as my suspicion, um, for example, my E. coli, then I'll probably want my gram-negative rod coverage to, my, to be my preference. So here, I'll probably give um, keftriaxone, um, as that covers both gram-positive and gram-negative rods. I can give them a fourth-generation um, kephosporins, for example, my kephapine, that has gram-negative cover. My ciprofloxacin um, has gram-negative cover. My levofloxacin, um, moxifloxacin, so all the floxacins, my fluoroquinolones, that is, um, has good gram-negative cover. And even my Bactrim um, has gram-negative cover, so, so sulfamexazole and um, trimethoprim. Um, I can give them gentamicin because I know gentamicin has excellent gram-negative cover. Um, and usually, as a rule of thumb for gut pathologies, so general surgical um, general surgeons give them. So ge general surgical residents actually give a lot of combination therapy. For example, they give them aminoglycosides, 
um, plus um, your gentamicin. Oh, sorry. So they, they give them amoxicillin plus your gentamicin. So amoxicillin covers your gram positive coccus and your 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 um your gentamicin covers them with gram negative rods as well as pseudomonas. Um, and you can use meropenem as well, but meropenem is more sort of your last resort. And meropenem covers your gram positive coccus, your gram negative rods, your pseudomonas, your anaerobes, your ESBLs. Okay. Um, and this is recorded, so so maybe maybe go back and just listen to what I've said and just sort of jot it down more more carefully. Um, but um, then I think about so after my gram negative rods, I think about my pseudomonas. Okay, so I think about what covers pseudomonas. I know third generation or fourth generation kefalosporins such as um, keftazidine or kefapine covers pseudomonas so those are good agents to include um, my ciprofloxacin covers pseudomonas my levofloxacin covers pseudomonas and my gentamicin covers pseudomonas so those are the agents um, my anaerobes again anaerobes differ in terms of whether it's oral anaerobes or gut anaerobes so for oral anaerobes my penicillin can actually cover my oral anaerobes um, and my moxifloxacin can cover my oral anaerobes as well. So my, again, my fluorocrinolones. Um, and my clindamycin is usually good for oral anaerobes. And my gut anaerobes, usually Augmentum, Piptaz, Meropenem, Metronidazole um, is good for my gut anaerobes. So oral anaerobes and gut manor, sorry, oral and gut anaerobes, Metronidazole. So a typical combination therapy regime is AMG. A stands for amoxicillin or augmentin. M stands for metronidazole. G stands for gentamicin, so aminoglycoside. Um, and if I'm suspecting ESBL or culture comes back ESBL positive, then meropenem or, um, or imipenem is the agent of choice to cover for the ESBL. And sort of going back to more resistant organisms, for example, MRSA, then I'll maybe go with um, vancomycin, daptomycin, linozolid, or even clindamycin. Uh, clindamycin, not so much. Probably vancomycin is my best agent for MRSA. Um, or even my fifth generation kephosporins, for example, my um, keftaraline. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. Um, but that's, that's sort of um, available too. Um, and atypical organisms, sort of your atypical infections, then usually depending on the culture, um, but you can go with, um, you know, your, your levofloxacin, and moxifloxacin. And they're, they're, the fluorocrinolones are pretty good with atypicals. Um, and so is your uh, azithromycin and doxycycline. They're pretty good with your atypicals as well. But that's pretty much it for my knowledge, my limited knowledge of antibiotics. Um, and again, um, consult, consult ID physician if um, organism is rare and always um, sort of start off with um, empiric antibiotics. So what, I've, uh, what I'm telling you is an empiric antibiotics, you would then tailor it to what the culture is susceptible to. So that's a general rule of thumb for antibiotics. And fluid therapy, I do have notes on this. So, can you see this? Can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay. So Ray asked for fluid therapy, and this is a tube that was given by my peer mentor. Um, I think it's pretty good in terms of just explaining all about fluid therapy. So first of all, indications of fluid, either for resus or maintenance, um, resus in more acute cases, maintenance for your more hospital inpatient stays. Um, so that's your first consideration. What's the indication of fluid? Second of all, assessment of your current fluid status. So you would assess JVP, capillary refill, how they, how dry they are in terms of mucous membrane um, for you to get an, uh, um, sort of a more accurate measure of their fluid status at the moment. Um, as if you are sort of looking at a patient over time, then you look at the weight. 
um, for how fluid depleted or um, completed they are. So three, you would consider a few different things in terms of how you want to administer the fluid or what things you want to give. So that depends on your route of fluid, uh, whether it's IV or oral, the type of fluid and the rate of fluid, okay? So in resuscitation, for example, in hypovolemic shock, um, Okay, so, so this is saying resuscitation given in hypovolemic shock, but um, sort of, but can't give in certain other shocks. So usually hypovolemic shock, you give fluid resuscitations, but in cardiogenic shock and obstructive shock, you want to postpone it a bit and you want to give it in <clears throat> distributive shock as well. So remember I said cardiogenic shock, obstructive shock, you want to treat the cause first and you can give um, inotropic support with presses, um, in cardiogenic shock, but um, and in obstructive shock, you give um, pericardial ascentesis, decompression of pneumothorax, and thrombolysis uh, for PEs. Um, but you wouldn't actually give uh, fluid therapy as such for cardiogenic and obstructive because that may further contribute to their shock status. Um, so you would give them fluid resuscitation, hypovolemic shock, and you you would give them in distributive shock. Remember, I talked about. Um, sort of fluid therapy until a central venous pressure of about eight. Um, so that's sort of thinking about resuscitation, maintenance, sort of um, thinking about whether they're fasting, whether they're kneel by mouth. Um, um, sort of we, we use it in bowel obstructions as well with the drip and suck um, mechanism. So we, we give a NG tube to decompress and we um, we give them um, laxatives, we give them fluid therapy. So basically following a drip and suck principle. Um, all for patients who can't drink enough. So for a lot of pediatric populations who are sort of consistently vomiting, we would want them to <clears throat> tolerate fluids either through NG or um, through um, oral fluid intake. But if they cannot, usually we want to give them maintenance fluid um, because they're either moderately or severely um, fluid dehydrated. Um, these are just certain values for like lights, don't worry about those. Um, yeah, don't worry about those. There's some extra stuff. Um, okay, so as a general rule, 250 mil per hour for elderly patients and 500 mil per hour for young but healthy um, sorry, sorry, to young but unhealthy patients. And for healthy patients, usually a general rule of thumb, you can give them up to five to seven liters in 12 hours. Um, that is for, um, the, the rate of flow um, for those patients as your um, sort of your fluid therapy. And in pediatric patients, that's different in, in terms of that you follow a four to one ratio rule. So if the kid is 24 kilograms, uh, for the first 10 kilograms, you give four per kilogram. So four times 10 is 40. For the next 10 kilograms, you give two meals per hour per kilogram. So that's two times 10 is 20. And for whatever's left, you give them one meal per hour per kilogram. So one times four is four. So for a 24 kilogram patient, you would give them 40 plus 20 plus four, which is your 64 mil per hour for that patient, okay? So usually that's a four to one rule. Now that rule can also be used for maintenance therapy in an adult patient as well. So it's actually not sort of specifically for um, pediatric patient as such. You can use it as your sort of calculation for adults. Um, again, sort of, it's good to know the different types of fluid. And I think that's the bulk of the knowledge that is needed for you guys. So types of fluid, we're not going to talk about blood products. So that's your um, cryoprecipitate. That's your fresh frozen plasma. That's your, um, that's your um, whole blood um, taken straight from the heme lab. Um, different blood products have their different um, uses in different resuscitation scenarios. For example, if I'm, again, sort of echoing from what I said, um, DIC patient, cryoprecipitate, 
um, platelet, um, platelet um, sort of low platelets. You can give them isolated platelets as well. You can give them um, you can give them isolated agents as well. Uh, for example, fibronectin. You can give them um, you can give them um, pure platelets too. You can give them just red blood cells. You can give them all sorts of things. Um, but that's another talk maybe with him. Um, so with the, with the next category, so that that's moving on to the colloids. So that's your albumin and uh, gelatin. Um, and it's restricted to resuscitation to bring up blood pressure in cases where, um, you've tried sort of your, other, your other stuff you've tried your fluid therapy and blood pressure is still not going up um, you can start thinking about colloids albumin to give them some osmotic gradient too um, crystalloids so that's the main bulk of what you would give as um as a sort of an intern um so crystalloids basically means salts can be divided into um isotonic hypotonic or hypertonic saline. Um, so in isotonic, there are three different um, sort of main types. So there's 0.9% sodium chloride um, used in both resuscitation and maintenance. Um, there's Hartman's or Ringer's lactate. Um, and also there's dextrose 5%. So in pediatric patients, dextrose 5% is usually used um however you run the risk of hyponatremia if you use it in resuscitation therefore usually 0.9 percent sodium chloride is used rather than dextrose five percent in resuscitation scenarios um and it's it's such it's um especially good in fasting patients with diabetes um sort of going back to the choice between normal saline and CSL or Hartman's or Ringer's lactate. Um, in, if you use sodium chloride too much, you can, um, you can cause a thing called hypochloremic metabolic acidosis. Um, and don't ask me why, but usually it's from the chloride that's um, sort of in addition um, that's used in the in, in, in the solution that can push you into a stage of hypochloremia. And I think there's a model of um, acid and base um, theory that leads to a good explanation of why an increase in chlorine can lead to metabolic acidosis, which I have not checked. Um, and in terms of Hartman solution, um, you can use it in acidic patients, you can use it in hyperkalemic patients, but not in brain edema patients. And I'll explain that a bit later. Um, so, okay, so that's pretty much it on isotonic. Usually the rule of thumb is use 0.9% sodium chloride, but not in excess, because um, you can get a phenomenon called hypochloric metabolic acidosis. Um, Hartman's solution is what they use in theatre a lot, um, and that can be used in resuscitation as well, but um, maintenance um, pretty often seen on the ward, um, but you wouldn't want to use it in patients with brain edema. Um, dextrose, not in resuscitation because rest of uh, risk of causing hyponatremia, um, and it's very good in fasting patients with diabetes. Um, so other crystalloids, hypotonic and hypertonic. So hypotonic solutions are sometimes used in um, hyperglycemic, hyperosmotic states, um, in, used in DKA as well, um, but not in brain edema. Uh, because in brain edema, you want, you want to give hypertonic solution to bring that edema down, basically. That's the reason behind it. Um, so, so, so usually HHS and DKA is the situation where you see hypotonic, um, crystalloids used in and hypertonic solution. For example, mannitol 
is used in cases where you have an increased intracranial pressure. Um, and it's also used to treat cerebr cerebral edema that's not due to um, that's not due to sort of your your um, space occupying lesions as well. So when you have cerebral edema for all sorts of reasons, you can use hypertonic saline. You can use um, I think you can use three percent sodium chloride, or you can use um, mannitol. Um, and I think. If you use it in excess, there's different implications in um, in um, the changes in ICP in that if you use mannitol in excess, when it leaks into the brain, it can actually suck the brain out. However, if you use hypertonic saline, if that leaks, it's generally safer. Um, it must be given in ICU, um, so either 3% or 5% with close monitoring of UEC. Um, because you don't want the rapid correction um, sort of causing, um, you know, your pontum myelolysis or your um, cerebral edema, depending on which way you're correcting it. Um, but if you're correcting up, it's usually um, uh, your central pontine uh, myelolysis. Um, but that's it for hypertonic. So just to repeat, isotonic, hypertonic, hy uh, hypotonic and hypertonic solutions are used in different situations. Um, in everyday practice, usually you would go with 0.9% sodium chloride or Hartman solution. Dextrose a lot used a lot in pediatric population. Um, hypertonic solution, HHS, DKA, and hypertonic solution given in ICU for things such as cerebral edema and mannitol um, to drag intracellular fluid back out into the extracellular space to be drained. Um, and that's usually used in um, your, for example, your increased intracranial pressures. Does that help you, Ray? This is fantastic, Jason. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? Hey, Jason. I was also wondering if you can go through the... Um, different generations of uh, cephalosporins. Yeah, sure, no worries. So um, again, no notes for it, but from memory, um, the different generations of cephalosporins are designed to have different coverage of different organisms per se. Um, first generation cephalosporin is your cephazolin or your cephalexin. So your cephalexin is taken orally um, for different infections, for example, urinary tract infections, or even um, your 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 sort of your your more superficial cellulitis. Um, so that's has that has the best coverage of gram positive coccus. Your first generation kefosporin, kefosolin, kefalexin, kefalexin taken orally, kefosolin taken IV is very good for gram positive coccus. So your staphylococcus, um, staphylococcus. Um, your streptococcus, um, you, you, so that's very good. Okay, your second generation cephalosporin, so an example is, um, I think it's called cephofetid or something. Um, so your second generation has more extended coverage towards gram-negative rods. Um, so whilst it has gram-positive co um, coccus coverage, it's extending to gram-negative rods. And your third generation, which is your kef trioxone and your kef tazidine, they are actually developed in different times. So your kef trioxone has gram positive coccus and gram negative rods coverage. However, your third generation kefosporin kef tazidine, which is also a third generation just like kef trioxone, kef tazidine doesn't actually have much gram positive coccus coverage. It's now covering your gram-negative rods and your pseudomonas. And your fourth generation, kefepine, has coverage to all things. For example, gram-positive coccus, gram-negative rods, and pseudomonas. And by all things, I'm sort of talking about just those three. Gram-positive coccus, gram-negative rods, and pseudomonas. And my fifth coverage, my fifth generation, kefosporin, so my um, keftaraline, for example, is actually a different spectrum. It's covering gram-positive coccus, gram-negative rods, 
my enterococcus and my MRSA. So that's a different spectrum altogether with the rest of the kephrosporins, although it's still covering the gram positive coccus and gram negative rods, it's also covering MRSA and enterococcus. So those are the five different generations. But I think for your sake, no one, two, three. Thanks, Tracy. So just a question. In a young adult who is dehydrated, presenting with diarrhea and vomiting um, in ED, what would you typically chart um, for fluids and over what time? Okay, so depending on the age as well. Um, so if I'm talking about sort of 20 to 30 year old who's dehydrated coming with diarrhea, first of all, um, I want to ask them if they can tolerate fluid. You always want to go with um, per oral if possible. If they're not tolerating fluid, I want to try putting them on anti-emetic, for example, or Dancitron for uh, four milligrams, um, just to see if that settles down the emesis and whether they can tolerate it. Again, with um, pain management analgesia. However, if they can still not tolerate it, and if the adults perfectly well, no comorbidity whatsoever, has no COVID, whatever, um, fully vaccinated, um, fully healthy. Um, so I, I, I'll, I probably would give them, depending on their fluid status as well. So going through my whole history examination investigation, I would I probably give them five to seven liters of normal saline and Hartman's over 12 hours. I think that's the general rule. So five liters is pretty safe. I can give them up to a liter uh, sort of fluid bolus um, just running through um, the basic rate. So basically uh, first 30 minutes or first 15 minutes, I can give them one liter bolus. Uh, but I, I, I want to be a, sort of as a maintenance fluid, sort of targeting at um, five liters to even seven liters per um, 12 hours just for that first um, half of the day and then sort of titrating down depending on whether he or she can tolerate fluid um, sort of encouraging intake by mouth does that answer your question Luke yeah um just another question um just with regards to the antibiotics you'd be giving if you were suspecting a GI issue um, so I know yeah. you mentioned AMG for the moxicillin, metro, and gent, but just typically on the wards, I've seen it more like kef and met instead. So yeah. is there an indication for which one or? Yeah, so kef and met is actually used a lot too. Basically, the reason is because kef trioxone covers most of what amoxicillin covers. Um, so kef and met covers a lot of it. So the only thing kef and met is missing um, that the AMG protocol is covering as well is your pseudomonas and your enterococcus. Um, so if the patient has gut pathology, which comes back positive for pseudomonas and enterococcus, usually it will, swap, it will be swapped to AMG. But yeah, usually your gut pathologies include gut anaerobes, includes um, gram-negative rods, for example, E. coli. And as I said before, keftriaxone covers your um, gram-negative rods. Um, and your metronidazole covers all your oral or gut anaerobes. So metronidazole and kefetriaxone is perfectly fine if you're not suspecting pseudomonas and enterococcus. However, if you're suspecting enterococcus and pseudomonas, then you would always go with um, gentamicin and amoxicillin and metronidazole as a combination. And the pseudomonas and enterococcus, would that mostly be targeted by amoxicillin or the gent? So gentamicin targets the pseudomonas um, um, as well as gram-negative rods coverage. Amoxicillin is targeting the enterococcus coverage. Okay, yeah, that's great, thanks. Whilst having GPCs and GNRs, amoxicillin. Any other questions? <laughs>